In the previous lecture, we focused on the first two steps of gluconeogenesis. Now we're going to basically discuss the remaining steps in gluconeogenesis. But before we actually look at that, let's remember what happened in steps one and two. So in step number one, which takes place entirely in the mitochondrial matrix, we have pyruvate being transformed into oxaloacetate by the activity of an enzyme we call pyruvate carboxylase. So basically this reaction involves the carboxylation of that pyruvate into oxaloacetate. And in step number two, or actually before step number two takes place, the oxaloacetate is transformed into malate. That then moves into the cytoplasm and the malate is transformed back into the oxaloacetate within the cytoplasm. And then then step number two takes place and it is catalyzed by PEP carboxykinase where PEP stands for phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxykinase. So we form in step number two phosphoenyl pyruvate. So step number one takes place in the mitochondrial matrix. Step number two takes place in the cytoplasm and all these remaining steps except step number 10 also take place in the cytoplasm. And we'll see where step 10 takes place in just a moment. So let's essentially discuss this section here. So once we form the phosphoenyl pyruvate, we essentially follow step three, step four, step five, step six, and step seven. And all these steps basically are the reverse steps of the steps we saw in glycolysis. And they even use the same exact types of enzymes. So we have Phosphoenyl pyruvate is transformed into 2-phosphoglycerate by the activity of enolase. We have 2-phosphoglycerate transformed into 3-phosphoglycerate by the activity of phosphoglycerate kinase. Then the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is transformed into these two molecules, so it's broken down into glyceraldehyde and DHAP, where DHAP stands for dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And in the seventh step, these two molecules are basically combined via the activity of aldolase to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So the question might be, why isn't these steps simply the reverse of the steps we saw in glycolysis, but these steps are exactly the reverse steps that we saw in glycolysis? Well, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, if we simply reversed the steps that we saw in glycolysis, in this particular case, those steps would actually be very endergonic. And so we don't want to have to input energy, and that's exactly why we change the reaction pathways for the conversion of pyruvate into phosphoenyl pyruvate. But in these steps, from three to seven, all these steps basically have a free energy value that is very close to zero. And what that means is they're essentially at equilibrium. And if our cellular conditions favor the formation of glucose, these reactions will readily take place in this direction. And the phosphoenyl pyruvate under those conditions that favor gluconeogenesis will be transformed into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate by the same enzymes that we discussed in the process of glycolysis. So once again, once phosphoenyl pyruvate is formed, once we form this molecule here, the reverse steps of glycolysis are followed until fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is formed, until we form this molecule here. And these steps, steps three to seven, are at equilibrium and will readily occur under the conditions that favor the formation of those glucose molecules. But why doesn't fructose 1,6-bisphosphate simply follow the reverse step that we saw in glycolysis to form the fructose 6-phosphate? Well, because in glycolysis, fructose 6-phosphate formed fructose 1,6-bisphosphate via an 
irreversible step. And what that means is, in glycolysis, this step was basically a very exergonic step. And in this case, we can't simply reverse the steps of glycolysis because that would mean we would have to input a very large amount of energy. And so for the same exact reason that we have to follow a different pathway to get from pyruvate to phosphoenolpyruvate, to get from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, we also have to create a completely different reaction pathway and we have to use a completely different enzyme. And that's exactly why the reaction pathway that we use is the hydrolysis of the ester bond between carbon 1 and this oxygen in this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So this is the reaction that allows us to basically convert the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into the fructose 6-phosphate via an exergonic reaction, an energy releasing step. So we have the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So carbon number one contains the phosphate group as well as carbon number six, and this is our fructose molecule. Now in the presence of water, which we have plenty in the cytoplasm, remember, all these steps basically take place in the cytoplasm except step number one and step number 10. And so the water is used to hydrolyze this ester bond via the activity of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Phosphatase, and remember, it's a phosphatase because phosphatases take off phosphoryl groups, while kinases actually put on those phosphoryl groups. And we basically break the bond, and we form this fructose 6-phosphate, and we release that inorganic phosphate, the orthophosphate, as shown here. Now, this enzyme is an allosteric enzyme. And what that means is it contains allosteric regulatory sites. And as we'll discuss in the next lecture, when, when we discuss how we regulate the process of gluconeogenesis, this enzyme is actually used to regulate that process. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is an allosteric enzyme that is also used in gluconeogenesis regulation. And this enzyme catalyzes the exergonic hydrolysis of the ester bond at carbon 1 of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So we see that these two steps and this step are different than the steps in glycolysis, but these steps are exactly the same. Now, once we form the fructose 6-phosphate, then we follow the same exact step as in glycolysis, except in reverse. Why? Well, for the same exact reason that we mentioned uh, here. Essentially, these two molecules in glycolysis are at equilibrium, and that means their free energy value is very, very close to zero, and so they're, equal, they're at equilibrium, and we can basically use the same exact type of enzyme phosphoglucose isomerase to transform the fructose 6-phosphate into the glucose 6-phosphate. So once fructose 6-phosphate is formed, it undergoes step 9, which is the reverse of step 2 that we saw in glycolysis. Now once we form glucose 6-phosphate, what happens next basically depends on the type of cell that we're in. In the majority of the cells of our body, for instance, muscle cells, the glucose 6-phosphate basically stops here. It is not transformed for, uh, further into glucose. And that's because in muscle cells, for example, in skeleton muscle cells, once we form the glucose 6-phosphate, we can now take that glucose 6-phosphate and either use it to form glucose molecule, uh, use it to form pyruvate molecules and then use that to form energy, or more importantly, we can probably store it as glycogen in case we have to use it later. Because remember, what is the difference between glucose and glucose 6-phosphate? Well, glucose can easily leave that cell, but glucose 6-phosphate is trapped within the cell. And so glucose 6-phosphate cannot actually escape the cell and glucose 6-phosphate can then be easily transformed into glycogen. And so 
If the cell wants to form the glycogen, why would it want to basically go on to form the glucose and then because then it would have to go on to reform that glucose 6-phosphate. So in the majority of the cells of our muscle like skeletal muscle cells, this step doesn't actually take place for two reasons. Number one, we want to basically make sure that glucose doesn't leave the cell. Number two, we want to have it in a form that can easily be transformed into glycogen. So once fructose 6, uh, so once the glucose 6-phosphate is formed, it is usually not transformed into glucose in the majority of our cells. And this is because glucose 6-phosphate, number one, cannot escape out of that cell, number two, can easily be transformed into, in, into glycogen. Now, what about cells like liver cells or kidney cells? Remember, the kidneys and uh, the liver basically are responsible for regulating our blood glucose level. So the liver predominantly regulates our blood glucose level while the kidneys regulate to a much smaller extent. But the point is because liver cells known as hepatocytes and kidney cells basically regulate the blood glucose level, these cells have to be able to form the glucose because only the sugar in the glucose form can actually leave that cell because glucose 6-phosphate is trapped inside that cell. And so hepatocytes, liver cells, and kidney cells have the ability to basically transform the glucose 6-phosphate into the glucose because then the glucose can exit that cell and, and, enter that side, and enter that blood plasma where the glucose can basically be used to maintain that concentration, that regular normal concentration in the blood plasma. Okay, so how exactly does step 10 actually take place? Well, first of all, as in this case and this case, step 10 in gluconeogenesis is not simply the reverse of step one in glycolysis. And that is because for the same reason that we discussed earlier in glycolysis, <coughs> the transformation of glucose into glucose 6-phosphate is a very exergonic process. It releases lots of energy. And so if we simply reverse the step in glycolysis, that would make it a very endergonic process in gluconeogenesis. And so once again, we see that this step actually follows a completely different pathway in gluconeogenesis. And as we'll see, it actually involves five different proteins. So we know that step one takes place in the mitochondrial matrix and these remaining steps up until step nine all take place in the cytoplasm. And so let's begin in a cytoplasm. Let's imagine this is the cytoplasm of our cell. So we have the glucose 6-phosphate. What happens next is we use a special type of membrane protein found on the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is the membrane of the ER and this is the lumen of the ER. And so what happens is by using a special membrane protein known as T1 or glucose 6-phosphate transporter, the glucose 6-phosphate enters the lumen of the ER. And once inside the lumen of the ER, the glucose 6-phosphate in the presence of water, because again, we have plenty of water in the lumen of the ER, it's transformed into glucose and a single inorganic phosphate, so orthophosphate is produced as well. And the enzyme that catalyzes this is actually a membrane-bound enzyme known as glucose 6-phosphatase, which is found on the membrane of the ER. On top of that, we also have another protein that essentially assists with this process known as the calcium binding stabilizing protein. So this here is the calcium binding stabilizing protein that assists the glucose 6-phosphatase to carry out its function of transforming the glucose 6-phosphate into that glucose. And once we form these two molecules, the orthophosphate, inorganic phosphate, basically uses its own type of transporter membrane to basically move into the cytoplasm of the cell. So this is the phosphate transporter T2.
while the glucose uses its own transporter, so known as T3, to move it, uh, back into the cytoplasm of that cell. And once inside the cytoplasm of that cell, if this is for instance a liver cell or a kidney cell, the glucose can be dumped into that blood plasma to basically regulate the levels of glucose in the blood plasma so that the rest of the cells can actually have enough glucose to carry out their cellular processes. So we see that in hepatocytes, liver cells, or kidney cells, glucose 6-phosphate is converted into glucose and this takes place in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So let's summarize our results. So we basically have step one that takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria, step two takes place in the cytoplasm, and both of these steps are basically different steps than the steps that we saw in glycolysis. Now, steps three through seven are the same exact steps as we saw in glycolysis. Step eight is not the same, step nine is the same, and step 10 is not the same. Step eight takes place in the cytoplasm, as does step nine, but 10 takes place in the lumen of the ER. Now, the final thing that I'd like to mention is, so remember, there are different types of uh, non-sugar precursor molecules that we can use to actually form glucose. So we discussed pyruvate, but we also mentioned lactate, amino acids, and glycerol. So amino acids, depending on the type of amino acid, the amino acids can be either transformed into pyruvate or the DHAP molecule. And they enter the process of gluconeogenesis to form the glucose as either this molecule or this molecule. So for instance, if the amino acid is transformed into this, then it combines with the glyceraldehyde to go on to form that glucose. In the case of lactate, it is transformed into pyruvate before it actually enters the gluconeogenesis cycle and glycerol is transformed into the, uh, the DHAP dihydroxy 